wanted to uh, briefly um, uh, walk through uh, a plan, Title VI analysis uh, that uh, that we are headed for uh, on uh, honored citizen fair uh, question. And uh, just by way of background, uh, you'll recall that um, at the request of the CAT committee and others, uh, we've frozen the uh, honored citizen fair uh, during the period when we were uh, adjusting the lift fair uh, uh, rate. Uh, we're now at the point where the honored citizen fair is below 50% of the adult fair, um, which is uh, the board's policy is to uh, have it at, at the 50% level. And there's now a differential between the honored citizen fair and the youth fair. So at the board retreat, uh, you discussed uh, the uh, notion of raising the honored citizen fair so that it's at that 50% level. Um, we're preparing to move forward with the Title VI analysis uh, of the options uh, that we can implement uh, that change uh, through. And there are basically two um, uh, methods of uh, raising the fair. There's a one-time only increase, and then there's a phase in. And then there are two questions around timing. Uh, one would be to do it uh, sooner rather than later, and the other would be to wait until after uh, or uh, concurrent with eFair or after eFair. Um, the uh, pros of a one-time only increase are that obviously it is accomplished uh, quickly. Uh, you only have one uh, communications and education process that you have to do with the, uh, with the honored citizen uh, uh, fair payers. Um, and you avoid uh, the uh, misconception that, if you will, that um, you're doing multiple increases. Uh, when you phase it in, obviously people can get confused and feel like you're actually doing more than one increase. Um, and with a one-time only uh, increase, uh, you don't have the problem of uh, having to revisit that question each year as you're doing the increases and potentially um, a different policy or some issue at the time uh, deflects that or changes that decision. Uh, a phase in, w the downside of a one-time only increase is that it is abrupt. Uh, this is a 25 cent increase uh, because the um, rate is low at a dollar, it constitutes a 25% increase as well, which is you were looking at the crime figures. Uh, if you start from a low number, you get a high increase in terms of percentage. Um, and there could be uh, uh, pressure to put in place a mitigation program for that. We have a mitigation program already that we can adjust and, and tweak, but uh, there may be additional pressure for that. Um, and there's a cost and uh, uh, staff uh, 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 dedication that would be required to implement that uh, program depending on how um, uh, uh, thorough or expansive it might be. Um, the phase in obviously uh, re reduces the initial uh, impact of the change, uh, allows people to kind of grow into and budget for the increase over time. Um, but again, it does require additional conversations with the community as you're doing those uh, incremental changes. The uh, question of whether we do it before or after or with eFair uh, is that if you do it before eFair, uh, obviously, it's done sooner. Uh, there's less opportunity for confusion about whether the increase is being done to respond to the policy of getting to 50% of the adult fare as opposed to somehow e-fare is causing the increase to occur. Um, so you avoid that. Uh, the downside of doing it before e-fare is in place is that we don't have the uh, fair capping and stored value and other benefits of e-fair that could offset some of the impact of the increase. Um, obviously, the flip side of that is to do an incremental increase after e-fair is in place uh, or in, in conjunction with e-fair, and then we would have um, some uh, mitigation that would be involved with the fair capping and so forth. So those are the four options that we'll be looking at, incremental, one-time only, uh, before eFair or with eFair. Um, and I just wanted to check in with you, make sure that we haven't missed any options that you'd like us to look at as we go through the Title VI analysis. And then obviously, uh, as part of this work, we will 
uh, have extensive conversations with the CAT committee and TIAC and other stakeholder uh, groups outside of the TriMet family. So. I'd point out the Finance and Audit Committee did have a, as Director uh, Prosser noted, uh, did have a pretty good dis discussion of this this morning. Mm -hmm. So it's new for a couple of you here at the table. So uh, I don't know whether you, members of the Finance and Audit Committee, want to make any comments for the benefit of uh, the two who weren't part of that discussion. Um, I'll start out, we, you know, we did have a good discussion this morning, um, and Consuelo and Joe, for your benefit, just so, so you know, one of the um, items of feedback that I gave is I'm personally not supportive of doing this in conjunction with eFair. Um, I, I think it's going to be too confusing, and I don't want to taint eFair in some folks' minds, because and it'll be, if that'll be a real easy connection to make, but it'll be an incorrect connection. Um, but even so, I think to take the four basic options forward to CAT and TAC in testing, you know, I think we should do all, test all four. It's just, it's going to be a real hump for, to get me over the connect, if it goes towards the connection with eFair, so. Director Prosser, uh, to do it before the e-fair also. That was kind of one of the main comments that I made in support of what he said. And I think all four are, are they really capture all the options, but just from a perspective of where he said, I think uh, the e-fair you know, has a lot of uh, moving parts, a lot of hydraulics associated with it. And I think uh, dealing with this you know, previous to or prior to the the e-fair is going to be, I think, I think it's gonna be critical to ensure that you know, we don't try and do all too many, way too many things when we roll out the implementation of eFair. So that's kind of just, do you have any thoughts or comments? Uh, no, what I was thinking and then I realized I answered my own question. Mm -hmm. just, um, <laughs> uh, just as the fairs go up in the next few years, of course, then it would be more uniform mm -hmm. is what we're trying to get to as okay. well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, th I think uh, it's a fair simplification is one of the things I think it's good. I mean, if I, like I was just in Phoenix where it's real clear that, you know, every everything for seniors and students is half of the regular fair. That's what they've done there as an example for all of their, all of their fair things. So I think that's simple, mm -hmm. makes, makes e-fair simple, but I, w I agree, I want to make it clear we don't want those connected. Yeah. So whether it's one time or graduated, whatever we want, whatever we do, I think, I look forward to the analysis. You know, we want to make it clear that they're not connected right. in any way. Yes. Okay. Director Esmond, do you have any thoughts? You said it all? Okay. All right. Okay. So, go ahead. I'm sorry, what was that? I listened to Travis, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so what I think we're saying okay. is go right. ahead. Those are, those, those are good options to look at, yeah. and we can have some real robust discussion right. on, on that as we move forward after we hear back from. We get the report and from the various committees give us some input. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Mary. Thank you. So if I could call up Dan and team on, we were going to give you a quick update on the uh, Portland Milwaukee project. And again, this is fundamentally the year that we start into the startup uh, in a very serious way. So a lot of activities about that that we wanted to share with you as well as a general project update. So Dan and Rob. Thank no, you. Daniel and Robert I see up there. Yes, <laughs> yes we're being formal today. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, Mr. Board President, members of the board. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and give you a, a brief update on the status of the Portland-Milwaukee light rail project. Um, I was last here um, to give you an update uh, in April, and uh, I'm happy to report that just as then, uh, I can say today the project is doing very well. Uh, meeting all of its uh, key performance indicators. Um, we are on schedule, we are below budget, we are doing great things for um, economic benefits. Uh, and we're really um, at a transition now in that we are less than a year to our grand opening in September 12th of 2015. And as you'll see in uh, this update, the civil construction work, that work that's on the track and the ground is, is almost 100% complete. Um, and the systems work, that is for the overhead electrics and the communication systems, signals and things like that, is over halfway complete. And we're now every day growing more and more as we expand the involvement uh, from the capital projects team into the entire agency as we get ready to 
uh, go through our rail activation program so that we're ready to be running on uh, September 12th of 2015. So I asked Rob Bernard to join me here today. He's gonna to cover the part about rail activation. Rob is our um, project director for the west side and the bridge, and those are both substantially complete. And so he stepped up to uh, lead the team's efforts in coordination with the entire rest of the agency to make sure we're ready to run. So with that, let me, uh, let me get started. As always, we'll start with safety. Um, we have two measures of safety. Um, the blue bars uh, represent our recordable incident rate. That is anyone who has an injury that requires something more than first aid. And as you see, each of these are for individual projects and then the aggregate for the whole project is this last one. And that blue bar compares to this blue line. We, we aspire to be below that line. Um, that is the state average for heavy construction. As you can see, we're about two-thirds of that average, so that's very good and, uh, and a better performance than our past Green Line project. The red bars indicate lost time accidents. Those are the more serious ones where someone actually was not able to report to work the next day or later that day. Um, and again, we're comparing ourselves to the state average, and as you can see, overall, we are less than half of the state average. So these are very, very good numbers and credit to our contractors and, and our inspector teams for really being vigilant about making sure we, we have our employees safe and send them home every day. Yes, sir. Can you uh, explain the, what the labels are along the bottom there? Yes, those are the various major projects that we're working so on. So West, West, Bridge, East, Ruby Junction, Systems, and then the overall project average. Thank you. Um, just to um, uh, quantify where we are, 85% of the schedule has elapsed, 88% of the cost has been incurred, and 90% of the project is physically com complete. And so again, that compares, those numbers all were running around 75% back in April. So we continue to, to track along. Um, economically, we're doing great on job counts. As you can see, our current number is 12,570 jobs created. Um, we actually do uh, physical counts of all of our construction jobs and our professional and technical jobs. The indirect and induced jobs are a calculation um, when we're following the methodology we used in our um, environmental impact statement to, to do that. So uh, we're still adding more jobs um, because as we enter different phases of the work, a different set of people comes in to do that work. And so even though we're nearing completion of you know where a lot of the construction jobs are, we still have new uh, folks coming out to, to do the work every month. Our workforce diversity numbers are really superb, 23.9% uh, uh, people of color, 8.5% uh, women in the workforce, and that compares to a national average of about 2.2. So that is really, really good performance. 17% uh, uh, apprentices involved, so not only are we employing people today, but we're growing people for the next projects that will come along in the region. And within the apprentices, 22% um, of those apprentices are women. So again, this project is helping increase the diversity as we go forward in uh, future projects. So we're very pleased with that. It's a little hard to see, but we're up to a total of uh, 2.25 million craft hours out in the work. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of hours. Um, we're also continuing terrific performance with our DBE program. $168 million have been awarded to DBEs so far. Uh, 130 different firms, uh, many of them have multiple contracts on several of the line segments. And if we look at our overall achievement, we took the, the five highest, um, the five largest projects, again, the same ones that were across the bottom before, and, and just looked at the aggregate. On the design contracts, we had 17.35% uh, participation. On the construction contracts, 234 And again, we went into the project aspiring to achieve 16 for both of those. So we're, we're really exceeding the, the performance indicators for DBE. Um, so we're really pleased about that. This is a pie chart showing how the money has been spent. Um, you can see 88 percent expended, the large blue numbers construction, so obviously now that's, that's far and away the single biggest category. 
uh, professional services right away is actually second largest as you'll recall through all those uh, activities that came here several years ago we bought a lot of property for this alignment and there's 12 percent remaining and one of the things I've reported on each time, you may remember this chart, and this chart looks at the construction contingency we had when we went into the project. We had it um, apportioned to different phases of the work from right away to design to going into bid, and then these three all related to construction, and then finally our owner's reserve, that is the, the sort of free board we have. The red indicates we've spent down the contingency for that, um, um, phase of the work. Uh, anything that was left over got scrubbed and moved over to here. These are all finished. Construction is ongoing. Uh, so the red is something we've already spent. The green is something we have set aside and expect to spend. And the blue is what's freeboard. So right now we're still doing very well. These three blue boxes add up to about $44 million. Um, we don't have all the facts yet, but that's our current cost to complete projection. And that's actually, for this point in the project, it's actually a little better than we expected to be, even in our, in the sort of best case scenario. So we're, somehow our best case scenario wasn't good enough. We actually did better than that. So again, credit to the team for all the great work they've been doing. Does that also indicate that you have no claims? Well, we don't have any either uh, money allocated in green for claims or spent on claims, yes. And, and I don't see likelihood that we're going to get any. Um, we, we could, but uh, we're working very well with all of our contractors. And I think the, the issues are being identified and, and they're dealt with here primarily. Okay. Yep. Got just a couple of photos I'll go through quickly. Um, these are mostly aerial photos. Uh, we have the project flown every once in a while to take pictures of it so we can see how it's performing. This is a view of the west side contract from the um, PSU turnaround going down Lincoln Street and toward the new harbor viaduct. Uh, so you can see that one is from a civil and a system standpoint virtually complete. That's a shot of the harbor viaduct itself. Uh, it really turned out uh, uh, really beautiful and, and fits the setting quite well. Technically, Bridge that is the longest. Longest. Yes, they're very proud that it's 10 feet longer than this and bridge. That one. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, this bridge is also substantially complete. Um, the remaining work, we're still doing uh, concrete finishes and installing the permanent handrails, and it, it really just looks spectacular. The contractor's done such an outstanding job. Uh, not only just getting it done on schedule, but the, going the extra mile to make it the beautiful bridge that, that it, it has become. And uh, I know many of you have had a chance to get out and see it up close. It, it, really, is, it really is turning out just, just magnificently, and we're getting such terrific public response on it. Uh, moving a little farther down um, toward the east side, this is a picture. The bridge is back here. The alignment runs along the UP Railroad, and here's where it crosses over Powell and begins its journey down 17th Avenue and uh, past TriMet's Center Street. Again, this section is virtually complete. A little farther south, as we come past the Bybee Station uh, and into the Tacoma Station, you can see the structures and track all finished here. The station is finished except for the shelters and amenities that are still underway. A little farther down than that, we come to the end of the, the line at Park Avenue. This is the three-track area at the terminus. This is where the plaza will be built, still under construction, and this is our Park Avenue Park and Ride Garage, which is uh, uh, just shy of substantial completion. And uh, again, really, really looking great. Uh, this is the Ruby Junction facility for, just as a reminder for Portland, Milwaukee, we expanded over to this side of uh, 11 Mile Avenue. We built these additional storage tracks, and this is a new wash bay and additional employee parking. That wash bay is here because there used to be a wash bay over here, but we expanded the maintenance facility to add another bay. So we put a maintenance bay where the wash facility was and built a new facility over here. 
Again, that work is nearly substantially complete. I think it was at your last meeting you approved a change order to rebuild the main switches for what's called the throat area, where all the trains come off the main line and into any part of this facility. Um, they're heavily worn, and with the additional traffic on PMLR, we, uh, we uh, gave a change order to replace those. As I mentioned, the systems work is now well beyond 50% completion. Um, that's the electri overhead electrification, signals and communication. And the vehicles are 69% complete as well. And there's a photograph of one. We had the uh, public unveiling of the first um, Type 5 LRV. Um, I'm excited for you to see them. Um, they really are different than the Type 4s. Each, each generation is slightly different. I think what distinguishes these are how open and light and airy they are inside. There's LED lighting in the ceiling, the windows are a little bit bigger, the seats are a little bit um, um, more room for circulation. Um, and I think when you see them, um, you'll really notice the difference. I think they're really beautiful. So we have two here so far. The third one is on the way. It got uh, tied up in some bad weather last week, but uh, we're, we're keeping close track on it. Yeah, are these Robert Siemens? Yes, they are. Down in California? Yes, uh, <coughs> their, their fab plant in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. So that's the general update. I'd like now to turn it over to Rob and have him tell you all the things that are happening with rail activation so we are fit and ready to run come September. All right, thank you, Dan. Um, as you can see, the project is advancing uh, really well. The team is beginning to shift its focus from construction into rail activation. And as Kurt uh, reported out when he was here for your September meeting, you know, the process of rail activation is to ensure that the project has been thoroughly tested and deemed safe for revenue operation. It really has three main components. First, you need to build it and fabricate the cars. Next, you need to kind of do the verification and testing to ensure that it was built and functioned as intended. And third, you really need to ensure that TriMet and the community are ready for their new service out there. So the team has been working on this for about two years. Back in September of last year, we approved a contract with um, Vicki Suman Barron to manage the rail activation. She brings a great depth of experience. She did it for us on the Green Line. She did it on the Hiawatha Project in Minnesota. And she's been working for about a year on this for us as well. So as I mentioned with Vicki leading the, the team, we have about an eight person team that's fully committed to rail activation. We have a series of plans that have been vetted both with the internal stakeholders, with the regulatory authorities, with the state safety oversight, ODOT Rail, working with FRA, Department of Homeland Security, and the FDA. Have a strong command and control structure, you know, lots of tracking mechanisms. We also have kind of a, a core team meeting that we have executive oversight. Bob Nelson, the deputy general manager, sits on those meetings. In fact, we're headed to that meeting next. And that's where really we do the coordination between capital, if we're building it, operations, maintenance, and the security, and look at all of the various elements in order to have a successful startup with the whole agency and the community. We're also managing all those turnovers. At 1.49 billion, you are building a couple of things. You know, there are 10 stations, 10 structures, 20 buildings, ruby junctions, vehicles, the list goes on and on. And you're managing those turnovers over the 10 major contracts incrementally. Well, you're turning over new vehicles to folks that are busy trying to run a railroad and move a small city every single day, in addition to all the things that we're building. So really managing that turnover to try to make it seamless, to not interrupt service to the customer. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of coordination. Also progressing towards that operational readiness. You know, that's ensuring that we're ready f to receive that service with all the training of our staff and with the public. And so those three legs I talked about that are necessary, we track those with our key performance indicators because you manage what you measure. That first one, of course, is completion of construction. Many of the items are at or near substantial completion. So the command center is fully operational a year in advance. Our shared transitway, which is a northern portion, which is where the buses will run. 
That will be ready in March so we can start our bus operator training, which takes about a half a year. The entire alignment's done in May, so in June we can start rail operator training for the whole alignment. So that's in uh, full swing. And of course, Dan reported on the vehicles, those are in full production. The next leg of that stool, of course, is building it and ensuring that it was built and functions as intended. And the team is really beginning to focus on that element. In the safety certification process, first you want to certify that it was designed in compliance with our criteria and with the noted threats and vulnerabilities. And then next you want to verify that it was built in accordance with the design. So that's about 10,000 items on that list that you track to make sure that it was designed like you wanted to be designed, and then you built it like you said you were gonna build it. We're about a third of the way done with that. Um, from the design side, about 90% of that certification is done. And just starting on the construction side, about 12% done with that process. But that really is integral to making sure that it is built in accordance with all the safety criteria and then start with the testing to make sure that part A works well with part B and they play well together and they're uh, functioning as intended. And so that process is underway as well. The next element is operational readiness and that's ensuring that TriMet and the community are prepared to re for the new service. A big part of that is in employee training. You heard Bob Nelson talk about that. For just Portland and Milwaukee only, you need about 23 rail operators, 11 streetcar operators, and about 50 non-revenue employees. That's in addition to the, all the people you need for the uh, restoration of frequent service, plus attrition for retirement. So it's a big training program. I think it's well over 500 people need to be brought into the system from fall of 13 to fall of 15 in order to feed the bus program, to feed the rail pro program, and the uh, rail control program. So we monitor that on a weekly basis against that plan. Currently, our intake is a little bit ahead of the curve, taking in more people than we uh, thought. We're graduating more than we thought. Attrition is a little less than we thought. So overall, with all of those metrics, we're ahead of the curve. Because, you know, here's the plan to bring in people, train them. Folks are going to retire. Where do we think we're going to be along this two-year journey? And we're a little bit ahead of the curve. So that's tracking well, and it's a massive spreadsheet that Bob's crews take care of, and it makes my eyes uh, glaze over. The next is the emergency responder training. Um, there's a mix of field training and tabletop exercises. We work with the local jurisdictions to identify those, refining those lists, and they're currently working to prepare the specifics of those. Looking in spring and summer of next year to implement those exercises. You know, the city of Portland is pretty familiar with our system, but Clackamas County has one line in the city of Milwaukee. This is new to them. I want to make sure that they're fully up to speed uh, when an incident uh, were to occur. The last element is the public safety and awareness. Uh, at the October board meeting, Coral Agnew came from our community affairs uh, department and gave a presentation on this. If you'll recall, schools within a half a mile of the alignment, uh, we've offered in-school safety presentations and then kind of the safety rides, the preview rides to the school-aged children. We found that that's very effective to drive the safety message home not only to the students, but also their parents who were in the cars with them. Um, so that work is well underway, coordinating with the school administrators to coordinate the timing of those events. And we've committed to come back to the board in the February timeframe, and again in May and June, to report out on the progress of that per your request. So as Dan mentioned, we're about 297 days, not that I'm counting, to a grand opening. Now on a 1.49, billion dollar project, you're 90% done. That last 10% is still a lot of work. There's still about 90 million to build and fabricate, which is no st small feat. But I would uh, assert that we have a good plan. 
We have strong command and control over the plan, and I'd humbly submit that we have a very great and dedicated team uh, who's fully committed to a safe and successful grand opening, and we look forward to delivering the next project uh, to the Portland region. Um, with that, I would be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's amazing to, to see all of uh, what's happened and, you know, just 10, what, 10% 10 to go, but still so much to do. Yeah, it's great. Thank you very much. This yeah, is very, thank you. very, very exciting. Go, go ahead. Is there any way the board can help you? Um, I think the board has been helping us okay. a great deal. I want to make sure. We're, we're not shy about asking for help. When, <laughs> well, when I'm, we I'm not it, shy at all, so about anything, really. The board has been extremely supportive okay. of all of our actions and uh, uh, all of the things we need to do to keep it moving, keep the community engaged, and, uh, and like I said, we, we have really assembled a terrific team. Some of these people have been here since the Banfield days. We add new ones on each new project that helps keep us diverse and, and learn new tricks, and uh, the team is, is really honed. Just offer. Thanks for your work, guys. Yeah, thank you. I guess I just note, I think the region will feel the loss of the confusion of the cash for these projects. It's really unfortunate the Columbia River Crossing didn't move forward for that reason because the, the, the impact of the economy is great and it, it, will, be un, it will be felt, I believe. Uh, if you have a few more minutes, we do have a little update on information veterans, but of course we could also... You okay? Um, you buy <laughs> <laughs> Yes. At some we'll point, buy. I will. <laughs> So it's up to you if you want to have all of us. I mean, you want, we can just it's, get. It's really up to you. I mean, no, feel free. To I, I think it probably if it'd be good. Uh, obviously, uh, all the other board members have the information, but maybe we can just sort of go through it quickly. I think sure. it'd be really good. And I would note that this is one of the initiatives we've ever undertaken. It was certainly given more, uh, a little bit stronger push by the Secretary of State's audit, and we have a very. I think sequential, well thought through plan that Shelley and Kimberly Akamoto would uh, like to share with you. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Board President and members of the board, the remaining members of the board. <laughs> By the way, it's afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for being so supportive and encouraging about the Information Governance Initiative over the last year, 14 months or so since we started to undertake it. And we've come to you a couple of times to tell you, you know, what we've done so far and where we plan to go next. And then we keep coming back to you two more times uh, to tell you what we've done and where we plan to go. And that's what we're doing again. We were last here in April. And we'll probably continue to do that, as you'll see, over the next two to three calendar years and fiscal years as this unfolds. So uh, I will uh, let Kimberly Akimoto, our records manager, uh, tell you where we are right now. Thanks. So thank you for the opportunity to provide this update on the Information Governance Initiative, especially since we're running so late today. Um, so as you may recall, the initiative was launched after an independent review by Stolburn recommended that TriMet make a large investment in the infrastructure need to manage, search, and produce documents in response to public records and legal discovery requests. So as a first step, we launched um, phase one of the initiative last fall and engaged iEmerge Consulting to assess the current state of our records keeping practices and also to make recommendations for improvement. Last November and December, our records consultants and I conducted um, interviews with subject matter experts in nearly all of TriMet's departments and the information we gathered was used to produce a couple of um, deliverables. The first was a high-level agency-wide file classification plan to standardize the way we organize and categorize records and also to improve the way we are able to search, retrieve, and manage those records. And also a report that assessed the current state of our information governance program and provided recommendations for improvement going forward. And the findings of this report, as you may recall, were um, presented to the board earlier this year in April. IMERGE's uh, 
iMERGE's recommendations are summarized in this roadmap, and as you can see, the initiative is a multi-year undertaking comprised of multiple projects and tasks running in parallel at different stages. And these are not one-time projects, but rather a long-term commitment that will require the ongoing um, support of management and the board. And when we began phase one, we anticipated procuring and implementing an enterprise content management system fairly quickly. And enterprise content management, or ECM, is um, comprised of various technologies that manage content from creation through final disposition. I think phase one, along with lessons gleaned from other agencies that have gone through the ECM um, process, has helped us to realize that while technology can be of great value, it, can, uh, it is not a panacea and it can make things worse if it's implemented poorly or prematurely. So we are now taking a more measured approach and focusing on projects that will provide incremental in, um, improvements and help better position and prepare us for an ECM in the future. An ECM is still on the horizon and we will reassess our readiness in 2016. In the meantime, we have chosen three projects from the roadmap to focus our current efforts upon in phase two. First, we are planning to improve the state of our offsite records. Second, we are working with staff to develop more detailed divisional file plans. And third, we are planning to analyze and clean up our unwieldy shared drives. All three projects are in support of the initiative's overall goals, which are to reduce risk, um, reduce cost, and also improve our ability to find the records and information that we need to keep TriMet running. So for our, our first project has been assigned to our new records analyst, Dan McGuire, who is here today. Um, one of Stoll Burns's recommendations was to increase staffing to assist with public records requests. So we hired Dan in July for that purpose, but also to assist with the initiative. Dan has a legal background and comes to us from the Oregon Secretary of State's Archives Division, where he served as a records analyst for nearly seven years. After a competitive solicitation, we recently awarded our offsite record storage contract to a new vendor called DataSafe. DataSafe offers cost savings and also a web-based application that will called ActiveWeb, which will provide us with the centralized tracking and inventory control that we've been looking for. Dan will oversee ActiveWeb, and he will also work on developing and implementing standardized procedures to ensure quality control. Access rights to DataSafe accounts have been reviewed and updated to make sure that the right staff have access to these records. And this transitional period is also a great time to review our offsite records for retention and disposition. And Jana Bray, our records coordinator in Capital Projects, has done a great job and made great progress in support of that. In addition to reviewing Interstate Max records for disposition, she is now working with staff to review other offsite inventory as well. And to date, she has identified approximately 300 boxes for destruction and is. Um, was the word, consolidating and reboxing other records to reduce storage costs and also to ensure the long-term preservation of their important records. The remaining two projects in phase two are focused on unstructured data. And unstructured data is generally data that is not in a database. Examples would include things like Microsoft Excel and Word files, PDF files, and audio, video, and photo files just the sort of data that you would find in TriMet shared drives. So. <laughs> yes, there it is. So this is a snapshot of TriMet's global drive, which is just one of many shared drives that employees use to store un unstructured records. And without standard file naming conventions or file classification, classification conventions or rules to follow, it's become very difficult to find anything in these shared drives. So for example, there is a file folder here that contains scanned images of intergovernmental agreements. Now if you were looking for one of these agreements, would you think to look for it in a file folder called E? <laughs> uh, probably not. 
So it's also difficult to apply retention and disposition rules within a shared drive environment. So what we have here is files that haven't been accessed in over a decade and folders that have been left over for, from former employees that haven't been touched. And it, essentially our shared drives have become a digital dumping ground and graveyard for unstructured records. So our next two projects were selected to address these issues. For our second project, we are working with divisions to develop more detailed file plans which will eventually be used to organize our shared drives. A standardized file plan adds structure to unstructured data and helps to mitigate risk by improving our ability to find the records and information we need for public records requests and legal discovery requests. Improving findability also means that staff can spend less time looking for or recreating records and more time focusing on their actual work. The file plan will be mapped to our retention schedule, so once this record is classified, we will know what the corresponding legal retention requirement is for that record. When we implement an ECM, the um, retention and disposition process would be automated based in, in large part on the classification system and retention rules we're currently building. So when I last updated the board in April, we had just launched a pilot project to develop the legal di division's file plan. Since then, we have we completed that pilot early in early summer, and since then, we have also completed work with labor relations and human resources. We're midway through safety, security, and environmental services, and we just recently began working with the general manager's division. Finance is slated to be next. <laughs> And we are streamlining the process based on lessons learned during this process, and I have taken on more of the work that was, re was previously conducted by our consultant, so we're proactively looking for cost savings where they may be found. For our third and possibly most challenging project, we are collaborating with our IT department on a shared drive analysis and cleanup. We plan to review and update access rights and privileges to ensure that the right staff have access to the right files. And this will help to mitigate risk, particularly where there are confidential or sensitive records involved. We also plan to dispose of records that we don't need to keep, such as records with expired legal retention requirements and extraneous convenience copies. This can reduce storage and also improve findability since there will be less clutter to sift through. We are planning to use a tool that we own called Veronis for the, to review our access rights and privileges and also to identify stale data which may be eligible for destruction. We are also investigating other technology that might help to automate some of the process by identifying old records and other low value data that can be reviewed and destroyed first. After the review process is complete, the shared drives will be organized in accordance with our standardized file plan. So next steps, first records analyst, Dan McGuire, will continue to coordinate the transition to data safe and will be working on developing and implementing standardized procedures for the offsite records. Legal was the first to develop its, its file plan and it will be the first to clean its shared drives and we expect to commence a pilot project early next year. And finally, we will continue working with the remaining divisions on developing their file plans. On a side note, I recently attended an annual convention by ARMA. ARMA is a professional organization and authority on governing information as a strategic asset. And most of, a lot of the sessions that I, that I attended helped to reaffirm that the measured incremental approach that we're taking is the right one. In fact, one of the sessions that I attended covered a successful project that more or less mirrored the path that we are currently on. So with that, I would like to thank all of you again um, for sitting through so late in the day for this update, and I will be back in the spring with another update. Uh, questions, comments? Just comment. Um, thank you for all this work. You know, and it, you may recall when I worked at the city of Portland, the records management function reported to me, and they taught me a lot. And so I know how big this is, and particularly electronic files. I mean, that's just incredible. And trying to pry individual files out of individual employees' 
hot, hot little hands is a major undertaking, but it provides major returns and really helps. So Dan, welcome. Thank you, Kimberly. Good job. Keep it up. So. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't. Uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't begin to. Uh, this isn't my my world, but uh, it sounds like. Um, once it's done, or is there a, like a stamp of approval, or uh, this is just to keep us? I think this defines continuous improvement. CIP, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's an ongoing project. But I mean, but we do have a we have a goal line that we want to cross, which is the implementation of an ECM. And there is a standard someplace across yes, the country. Through Irma. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank I want you. to say thank you, too. Good, good. good work. And I know what it's like to convince some people that they need to go along and do this. So that uh, pride of ownership is, is very hard. <laughs> so so we'll look forward to the next report. Congratulations. Thank you. Is that it, Mr. General Manager? That's it. Thank you for your patience. Right. Well, thank you very much. And thank you guys all for hanging all in there. Time today. We'll see you again in about a month, right? Yeah. <laughs> and happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Yes, same to you.